What's up guys and welcome back to another video. So in today's video we will go through the matplotlib library of Python. And this is a super useful library for all things data visualization in Python. So the video will start off with going through the matplotlib basics. So as you see on the screen we'll be creating like line graphs such as the one you see here. You'll learn how to format these lines in different ways. You'll be able to add a title. You'll be able to add labels to your x and y axes. Um, format your tick marks properly, add a legend, etc. So all the kind of basic matplotlib things you want to know. Then we'll move into other types of graphs such as bar charts and we'll finish this video off with going through all sorts of like real world examples where you can kind of combine your data science skills um, that you might have using like pandas library and if you haven't learned anything about the pandas library I recommend you watch my video on that. Um, so with that, the kind of the real world examples, we'll do stuff such as like plot the USA versus Canada gas prices off of uh, data that we have that I'll link to in a CSV. Uh, we'll do some histogram stuff. We'll do some pie chart stuff. And we will do some box and whiskers chart stuff. Uh, I can't get through every type of graph in this one video, but if there's certain things that I didn't cover and you really want me to cover, let me know in the comments. That would be super duper. Uh... Yeah, that's all I got to start this video. Let's just jump into it. All right, let's start out by loading in the libraries that we need for this tutorial. So we're gonna import matplotlib as, or dot pyplot as plt. We're gonna import numpy as np. And we're gonna, for the later examples, import pandas as pd and run that. And so if you have all these uh, like already installed, you won't get any errors. If you do get these, get an error when you're trying to run one of these, you probably need to install it. So you can either do a pip install matplotlib, pip install numpy, pip install pandas, or you can install a Python distribution that already has these packages, such as Anaconda. I'll link to how to do this in the description. Okay, so now we have our libraries loaded. Let's now build our basic graph. So I always think it's kind of the hardest part about anything with Python in general is starting with that blank blank space. So what I recommend for matplotlib is always start at the documentation. So I have a link for this in the description, but here is the home page of the matplotlib.pyplot documentation. And what I recommend is like whenever we're trying to do something new, just do a control F and like look for it. So if we look for plot here, that's like we're just trying to get a line graph on the on the screen. Uh, box plot's not what we want, we don't want it. Bend plot, okay, this looks good. Uh, plot y versus x as lines or markers. So this is what we'll start off by doing. As you can see right here in the examples it gives, it gives plot x comma y. So that's the command we'll have to run to make this work. Uh, and just to know what x and y are, if we go down to parameters, they tell us that commonly these parameters are 1D arrays. So we know we need to pass in 1D array to the plot function. So if we do plot one, two, three, that's gonna be our x, and uh, two, four, six will be our y. Uh, I can't type, and run that. Uh, plot is not defined. So we imported pyplot as plot. So when we run this function, we actually have to do plt.plot, and then this is our x and the second array is our y. So let's see what happens there. Yay, we get a graph. And to clean this up a little bit, I recommend um, moving our variables into, or moving our arrays into variables. So x is one, two, three, and y is two, four, six. And we can change now this to x, y. And one thing that's annoying with the matplotlib, if you're doing this in Jupyter Notebook by default, is you have this annoying little line here. So if you want to get rid of that, you can just actually call plot.show. And that's the correct way to actually show this graph. Okay, now that we have just a line on the screen, let's uh, start adding a little bit more to our graph. So to do this, let's go back to our documentation and go back to just the pie plot. So I think this is a good spot to start because you always can kind of just control F and find something you're looking for. So let's say we wanted to add a title to our graph. If I type in title, 
Um, it points me right to a couple different places that I probably want to look at. And right here is what we're looking for. So set a title for the axes, click that. And this tells me all sorts of stuff about how I call this. So it looks like I can just do pyplot.title. So I can do plot.title and let's just do our first graph. And run that. As you can see, our title is now there. And same thing for a lot of the um, different parameters. So going back to the documentation, if I want an X label and a Y label, I just type in, or I guess I knew that, but let's just say um, Y label, nothing comes up. Y, or just even label. C label, label a contour plot, that's not us. The fig label is no, pi, no, um, title, no, x label, y label. That's how we get there. So you can keep doing this and really easily find what you're looking for. I think it's a good place to go if you kind of just, if you forget things, because I always forget things with Matplotlib. Okay, so adding a label to x and y, plot.x label, x axes. And I'm, I guess I'm getting really enthusiastic because I keep adding exclamation points to all my stuff. Y axes. Yay. Let's see what happens. Yeah, and I'm gonna just get rid of these exclamations. I don't need them. Okay, so now we have a graph and we have a title and we have Y axis, X axis. Um, in a real graph, we would label these properly, but for the sake of this example, we're just kind of getting a feel for how we add these. All right, so now that we have our title and labels, one thing we might want to do to them is resize them. So if we look at the, the documentation for title, one thing you'll notice is that you can use, you can pass in this font dictionary. And it gives you a little bit of details about the font dictionary here. But basically there's all sorts of options that we can do and like play around with our font. So let's say I wanted to change the font of our title. I do font dict equals and I can pass in font uh, name. And let's say my good old trusty reliable Comic Sans MS will be our new font. And if you look at that, uh, we got a nice new font uh, on our graph. And if you can't see it, well then in that case, I'll change the font size to be something like 20. Now you should definitely be able to tell that uh, I've changed the font uh, type. And uh, in the description I listed, I put a link to all of the known uh, matplotlib fonts that you can use. And if you look through the documentation, you kind of find some different options you can do with this. Uh, and you can also do the same thing with the labels. I could do like font dict equals, let's say I wanted to make this font rel. And that honestly might be the default, but if I did it like Comic Sans as well, you can tell that the x-axis now has changed. But I'm gonna just leave that this be for now. Okay, so we did labels. All right, so now one thing that's bothering me is the tick marks. I wanna, let's say I just wanna do integer numbers and I'm gonna add a couple more values to our graph. So I'm gonna to go to five and we'll start at zero and y will go from, y is always gonna be two times x, so uh, it's gonna look like that. Oh wow, it uh, magically did it for us in that case. Uh, I don't want it to magically do it for us, okay. Let's say we went to four and we wanted just the integer values, we didn't want any of the decimal values, so how do we change our ticks? So, we can do that by doing plot.xticks, and our x ticks will do 0, 0, 1, 2, 3. And I also just found, remember this command by using the documentation, and our y ticks will be, uh, how about 0 to 10 every 2. So it's z uh, 0, 2, 4, 6, oh my gosh. 
10. As you can see that, now we have the tick marks working properly and maybe I wanted to add four as well. So now we labeled our ticks differently. And one thing that's cool to know is that the graph will automatically resize based on how we set this. So if I set one tick to a thousand, <laughs> well, now our graph kind of looks like uh, not too good. Um, but it's nice that you can easily do that uh, for is better. But and you can do the same thing with Y. Let's say I wanted to make the last one 100. As you can see, it changes up the, the sizing of the graph. One thing that's also cool though is if I, even if I didn't evenly space these out, if I did like seven here and then 7.5, as you can see, it properly puts those at the right spot in the graph. I'll leave it like this. I'll leave it a little bit weird, but yeah, that looks good to me. Okay, so we have our first graph. Let's uh, add a legend and make this line a little bit more exciting color-wise. So if we wanted to add a legend, we can do, and I'm gonna actually, cause I like showing how the documentation is helpful. If I looked up legend, fig legend, that might be work. Um, just this legend, place a legend on the axes. Uh, like by looking up legend, I, I figured out that the call is just legend and it gives me some examples. So I always like to refer to this documentation. Um, okay, so plt.legend. And what happens when I do that? No handles with labels found to put in legend. So it's complaining because we don't have anything to label. What it's saying is, how do we label this line? And the way we do that is by passing in a label to our plot function. So in this case, our x and y, we plotted x to be, or y to be two times x. So I'm gonna call the label here 2x. And as you can see, we get 2x right there. Okay, let's say now that we wanted to change up the color of this line, maybe make it thicker, um, do some other things to it. If we go to plot, Where is plot? We'll see all sorts of properties that we can do in plot. So what I'm seeing right here is you can pass in all of these different um, parameters to our plot. And it probably lists off what we can put, maybe not. It's not super specific, but if you look hard enough, yeah, you can see all of these properties that you can pass into the plot function. So one thing we could plot pass in is color. So if I passed in color equals red, it'll work. And it will know, I think, the common color. So if I did yellow, if I did like yell, which is not a color, it's gonna yell at me. It might even work with Y. Yeah, cool. And we also can pass in um, hexadecimal colors. So I could do like A, B, A, B, A, B. And we get like a grayish color. Um, you can, this is helpful because you can pick, use like a color picker tool and pick pretty much any color we want here, but we'll stay with red for, for now. Um, the other parameters I could pass into that, let's see what else we had. Um, I could do, I think line size equal, let's say 12. Oh, that is not a parameter. Ah, not a parameter either. Go back to my documentation. Size, marker size, maybe that's it. Marker size, oh, I also see line width here. So line width equals two. Oh my gosh, line width equals 12, makes this big line, maybe two. Uh, it's a bit bigger than I think what we had. We can also do, we can label a marker. So let's say I wanted to add dots into this. As you can see, you can't really see it too, too well, but maybe if I made the marker size a little bit bigger. And I'm just kind of passing these in so you can kind of see what you can do. Oh, that didn't work. Let's say 10. Yeah, as you can see, now you see big dots on our graph. I can also do uh, marker edge color. 
there's all sorts of properties. I'm just like continually passing these in, but now you see a different type of dot and whatnot. So this is pretty cool that we can have all of this customization. It sometimes takes a little while to get what we want, but it's usually, uh, it's just nice to have this power. Uh, and one final thing I'll pass in is uh, line style. So there's all sorts of line styles we can pass in and you can read all into the different ways you can do this in the documentation. One thing that's pretty cool is that instead of listing all of these keyword arguments, sometimes we just want to make a different type of line quickly. So there's actually a shorthand that you can use to kind of do pretty much the same thing. So if I comment this out real quick, we have no graph. Um, what you can do is there's a shorthand notation that allows you to kind of have a pretty good amount of customization quickly. So the shorthand notation is color, marker, line, style, I guess. So if we go and copy this line from above, let's say we just passed in this. Now what we can do is before we add our label, we can pass in the shorthand notation. So I can do color, we'll say red. It, I think it just accepts letters. You can look into the documentation and see exactly what it does. Marker, we'll do a dot, and then line, we'll do a dash. So watch what happens when I do this. Gives us a nice line with dots in it. If I do two dashes, gives us a dotted line. If I do like a different type of marker, I can pass in like a carrot like that gives us a line with carrots in it. It's kind of cool that you can do this shorthand notation and get different types of lines very easily. Just to follow up on the whole shorthand notation, um, I'm pulling in the docs for the plot function. Uh, it shows all the different markers you can use and the different line styles supported and the different colors supported. So check out um, the plot documentation to see all that. All right, let's move on to our next thing, and that will be, um, I guess, let's just add another line real quick to our graph. So we have our first line. Let's add uh, line number two. And this one will make a little bit more interesting. And the thing is like here we had a very straightforward, like you have X and you have your Y. Um, but this is not always easy to do, especially if you have like a function like sine where you want to plot it at like a bunch of values, but those values are all like, you know, crazy decimals. So I'm going to show you how you can handle something like that. So this is where we use numpy. So I'm going to call this x2. I'm going to say that x2 equals np.a range 0 to 4, and we'll go by 0 0.5 as our tick. So if I print out x2 real quick, you see that this gives us a numpy array with 0, 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, 3.5. I'll actually make it go to 4.5 so it goes to the same spot as our other graph because this is uh, exclusive here. So we have that. So that's going to be our x's. Um, and so what I can do here is I can go ahead and plot that. And I'm going to plot the square function for it. So I'm going to pass in x2. And then instead of passing in a y, I'm just going to do x2. And I'm going to do squared. What happens here? So now you see we get um, x2 squared. It goes a little bit higher than our original axis was set. So I'm going to change up the, the ticks. Or maybe I'll just kind of comment this out and see what happens for our tick marks. Yeah, I'm fine with just leaving the default that it gave us. Looks good to me. And now we have two blue colors, so let's make this a different color. Maybe you make it red. We want to give it a label as well. So I'm going to do red. And I'm going to say the label is equal to x squared. And one thing that's cool is that it automatically moved this legend to the top left because the positioning was better now that this 
goes up to the top right. All right, so we have two, two lines up there. And from the original image I showed, there's some stuff that's still different. One thing that's kind of cool that you could do um, is let's say you had a graph that stopped, but you wanted to kind of show the projection of it uh, in the future. So what I did to show that type of a phenomenon is I did like X2, take the first four values um, here and we'll plot that. Ah, what did I do? Oh, shoot. First four. Um, is that what I want? I think that will work. Take the first four and plot that. And then for the last values, so from, let's say, five or three on, or let's make this a little bigger. Make this six or five. Bear with me here. From four onward, we'll make it a dashed line. And I had a little bit of overlap because I think it'll look better. You'll see in a sec. Four dash. We'll make this still the same function, but this time we're going to make it a dashed line. So there you see, and I'm going to actually make this a little bit different. There you see like maybe something ended here and then you make it dash the rest of the way. You could do something like that um, using the format I just showed. All right, uh, what else do we have? I'll probably clean this code up a little bit. Um, another thing that I showed in the original graph that I showed when I was uh, introducing this video was a resize. So let's say we wanted to resize our graph. Well, we should do that probably near the top of our graph. So I'm gonna go ahead and do resize your graph. I'm gonna go ahead and do plot.figure, pass in fig size, and we're gonna say, let's make the dimensions five by three. Um, it's kind of an arbitrary five by three. Um, that will give you kind of the ratio of your X to your Y. Um, but to specify how many pixels it is, you're gonna to wanna to pass in a second parameter, which is DPI, which basically is pixels per inch. So I recommend using a value of around 300 here. Um, if you do smaller values, you'll have more pixelated graphs. So if you can afford having a bigger image, um, having a bigger DPI is often nice. So in this case, we have pixels per inch of 300. So this is gonna actually be five inches by three inches. So the total pixels will be 1500 by 900 here in this graph. So now it's much, much bigger. Maybe it's a little bit <laughs> too big. Um, I didn't, I'm gonna be blocking this graph. Uh, so I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller. But you get the idea then here. So I'll make it like two by 1.5. Uh, it's not a good dimensions now though. Um, I mean, just play around with this. The, the biggest issue I have right now is the graph looks so big because um, I have my screen super high resolution or super, the view is like very up close because I wanna make sure you guys can see my code. But yeah, this would be a 1500 by uh, 900 graph. I'm gonna just for the sake of the graph, decrease the DPI uh, and make it more reasonable. The, the issue, you can't really tell from this image, but if you really zoom into the graph and maybe if you like printed the graph out, uh, it would look maybe a little bit pixelated with a DPI of um, 100. So probably try to keep this value higher if possible. And then another thing you want to do is you'll want to save your graph. So to save, we can do plot dot <coughs> save fig. And, <coughs> and we can do 
say bygraph.png. And one thing that's nice too, is I could pass in the DPI parameter here as well. So let's say when I actually saved my graph, I wanted it to be bigger, but for the sake of being able to show you guys it in a smaller format, I wanted the 100 above. I can still go ahead and save it with 300 and then kind of solves both of my problems. And so this then my graph.png will save in the current directory that this matlab, matplotlib tutorial is in. It will, yeah, it will save in that current, the current directory, whatever, file, whatever directory your file matplotlib tutorial is in, this graph will also save there when we run this. Cool, now we have that saved. All right, let me clean this up a little bit. And just to note, the reason I did this is because this is exclusive, the six here. So when I do five onwards, it picks up, this actually ends at five because it doesn't include six. So it actually covers everything here. All right, now that we've shown line graphs a bit, uh, let's go and do quickly do bar charts. And after bar charts, I think we're gonna just end this video short and I'll do the real world examples in a, a video that I'll post next week. Uh, I just think this video might get a bit too long if I include everything in just one video. So, all right, so I wanna do bar chart. Okay, so bar charts are pretty straightforward as well. Let's say we had some labels, A, A, B, and C, and some values that say one, four, and two. Well, if we wanted to do a bar chart, we could just do plot dot bar of labels, comma, values, uh, I probably did that wrong. It's values comma labels and we get not what I was looking for. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Um, it is actually labels first, then values. A, B, C, cool. So that, that was pretty straightforward and I can do the plot dot show. We can do all of the adding of titles and whatnot the same way as before in the line graph example. Let's skip over that for now. Uh, could also resize it, let's say. So I could do plot.figure, fig size equals, let's say, six by four. It's gonna use whatever the default DPI is. And then one thing that's cool that you can do with bar charts is you could add different patterns to these. So to do that, uh, and you can you can really play around with the documentation, do all sorts of different things. I just am kind of following the graphs that I was showing in the inter intro of my video, so I wanted to just show kind of what different hatch values look like. So I can make the first one have, uh, I'm gonna say, uh, bars equal plot dot bars. There we go. Now I do bars zero set hatch. That's going to give me the lines that you see down here. I can do the same thing with the second value. Let's make this um, circles. And you can find all the hatch values uh, in the documentation as well. Let's do the third value. We'll do stars. So now you get kind of a cool little uh, bar chart. I could also add a legend to this very easily. And this will tell me right away that we have A, B, and C, but I mean, they're labeled right here. So legend's probably not necessary in this case. Uh, all right. 
Let's see, what else did I want to do with this? And then if you wanted to make this a little bit neater, if you had like many more, it might get tiring to do this. So you could do something like patterns equals slash uh, O and star. And you could do, instead of this notation, you could do ah, for bar and bars bar dot set hatch um, guess we want an index as well we'll just do actually patterns dot pop first item off so this will get us our right one for each one it should yeah look at that if I did pop regular I think it would take off the last so this will be stars instead of Yep, look at that. Yeah, so basically what it did is it just popped off the first item for the first bar, popped off the second item for the second bar, and then popped off the final item for the third bar, as you can see there. Uh, in this video, we're gonna build off of what we did in the last video, which was kind of an introductory video to matplotlib library of Python. So in this video specifically, we're gonna be kind of doing some real world type examples so basically combining our knowledge of the pandas library with the matplotlib library to create all sorts of different plots based on CSV style data. So we'll start out um, with a spreadsheet that I'll provide on my GitHub page, link in the description, to um, gas prices uh, over time for different countries. So with that data sheet, we'll build uh, charts such as the one you see here. Uh, then the second data set that I provided is a list of all the game, the video game FIFA's uh, player stats. So if you're not familiar with that, basically all of the soccer players, or I guess if you're an international viewer watching this, all the football players in the game FIFA uh, provide all of their like overall stats in the game. And we'll build gra uh, all sorts of charts off of that. So we'll do like histogram stuff with players overall rating in FIFA. Um, some pie chart stuff, um, some more pie chart stuff, a little bit more complex, and then finally some box and whisker chart stuff uh, based off of the FIFA data. And if we have time, maybe one or two more graphs. Uh, before we begin, a couple quick, uh, I guess, announcements. First is, if you've enjoyed any of my videos, it'd mean a lot to me if you can subscribe. Uh, and also along the same lines, if you don't mind, also following my Instagram and Twitter. Uh, basically, the more followers I get on all my social media platforms, uh, the more content, the more, more serious that I'll take uh, this, and the more content that I'll produce. All right, we'll start this video off the same way we started the last video. Make sure you load up the necessary libraries. I'll be editing with Jupyter Notebook using Python 3, but you can be using uh, other IDEs and text editors as well. So we're importing these three libraries, matplotlib, numpy, and pandas. Then the next step will be to download the data that I provided for this. So to do that, uh, go to my GitHub, which is in the description, and we want to download two different files. So the files, the first file we want to download is this gas prices. So the easiest way to think to download this is go to the raw, and then just do save as. Um, you can, and you want to save it wherever you have your code. So my code, these Jupyter Notebooks for me are in this matplotlib tutorial directory. So I would save this value here. As you see, I already saved it. And then for the, the other data file, the uh, FIFA data set, we're gonna wanna do the same thing. So go back to the main file in the GitHub, click on FIFA data. This one, you can't even preview, but just click view raw, right click and save as, uh, you wanna save it as a, CSV file, so a comma separated values file. And you'll also want to save this in the same directory that you have the file that you're writing your code in. Okay, so now that we've uh, saved the data, let's start playing around with it. And if you remember from my pandas video, the way that we can uh, look at a CSV file with pandas is we can do something like we'll call the CS or we'll call our data gas equals pd dot read csv then we need to type in the name of the file we want to read we've saved it as gas prices dot csv 
and we should be able to run that, no issues. And we saved this file in the same directory that this matplotlib tutorial file is in, so that's why this worked. If you save this file in a different directory, you can um, specify where you saved it. So if you save it in like a data folder, you would specify it such uh, with this type of syntax. Okay, gas. So now what we can do is look what to see what's in our um, this data file. So if I just do gas, and this works in Jupyter Notebook, but in another, uh, if you're just using like Sublime Text, you'd have to like print gas, um, and, or you could just be looking at the actual CSV file in like Excel. So gas, we have year, and then we have all these different countries and their price in US dollars per gallon for gas that year. So the way I look at this, we're gonna have year as our X input. So, ah, stop texting me. So based on the year, each country has a different gas price. So the way we can access that is we can do something like plt.plot and so our x data is going to be gas.year our y data is going to be let's say we start with usa so usa is all caps here so i have to follow that same syntax when i'm accessing that gas.usa and then i can do plot.show and i think already there we'll have a basic graph up and running so as you can see yep this is the basic graph for our data. And we could also add another country. We could do plot dot plot. Let's add Canada year gas dot Canada. I think, yeah. As you can see, now we have two different graphs. And as you can see from this, um, it's easy to see more easily than just reading the CSV that, oh, okay, every year gas in Canada is consistently higher than in the USA. Uh, but we have some problems with this graph. So like one thing that I see that's an issue is <laughs> all these years, like, I don't know, I think it just makes more sense to be looking at the exact year, especially since this data wasn't like broken up by month. So like, I don't like the x-axis labels. We have no title. We have no real good indicator of what these values mean over here on the y-axis. So we need to start fixing some things up. And quickly to note, if you have like a multi-word name, this format of dot year probably won't work. So you could also do bracket notation to access that field. As you can see, it still works. So if we had something with two names, and I don't remember, let me look at the data again, see if any countries have that. Uh, South Korea, for example, like we would have to use this syntax. So I'll actually plot South Korea's um, gas in this list, their gas prices. So plot dot plot gas year gas dot South Korea wouldn't work. Maybe actually it would work with the underlines. I'm not sure. Yeah, South Korea's having issues. So what we can do is South space Korea. Now we have three lines and wow, yeah, the, the gas in South Korea is even more expensive. Okay, it's just kind of bothering me mixing these different ways to do this. So I'm gonna change this back to year, change this back to year and only leave South Korea like that because it kind of has to be like that. Okay, so now we have some plots. Let's make this uh, graph overall better though. So to start, let's add a title. So to add a title, if you remember from my last video and feel free to review that again, we can just use pld.title. I can label this like gas prices um, over time in US dollars. And so it still doesn't make too much sense because you see all these lines, but you don't know what they represent. I mean, we only know that what they represent because we see the code here but we should add a legend. And so to add a legend, we're gonna have to first give these plots labels because if I don't give these labels, watch what happens, plot.legend. Oh, wow, it worked. I was not actually expecting that to work. Um, 
trying to think why that is that it worked. Whatever, it worked without needing to add the labels specifically. Uh, so that's kind of nice for us. I guess due to the fact that we're reading this in and we kind of, from a nice CSV that already has headers, it probably worked. But in our last video, uh, you had to add label. So I could actually change the label if I wanted to. If I wanted this to just say United States, see that change it like that. So you can add this optional label parameter if things aren't working for you properly. But for us, it uh, just kind of magically did the trick. Okay, so this is looking already a little bit better. Um, I might make the graph a little bit bigger. Let's do that. I can do plot dot figure fig size equals say eight by five. So that, that's a nicer size. I think it's more easy to see everything. The legend is a more reasonable size in comparison of everything in there. So that's a bit better. What else can we do to this? Well, we don't have any labels for axes, so we should definitely do that. Also, I really don't like that these tick marks are not exact years. So I think the next thing I'm gonna do is change up the ticks. So X ticks. Um, what we can pass in is just the year here. So now it will have a tick for every year that we have data for. Wow, and that looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, yeah, obviously issues with this, um, too squished together. So what can work well is if I print out gas.year, you see we have it's part of a pandas data frame, but we have every one of these years. If we remember, you know, some good old list, or list, yeah, not list comprehension, but list iterating syntax, maybe that would be the word, but uh, you know, when you want to get certain items, like the first five items in a list, you go zero to five, um, or you could even just do five. Um, what we want to do is iterate, you know, maybe take every three years. So what we could do to do that is we don't care where we start. So we want to start at the beginning. We want to end at the end, but we want to skip every three years. So now we get all of the years in a, we get every third year, which will probably be better when we graph it down here. So I'm gonna do that now. So guess year, tick, tick, three, colon, colon, three. Cool, that looks pretty good. Um, all right. I also kind of would like to have exact values here, kind of show exactly where we're plotting the points. So to do that, if you remember the shorthand notation from the last video, we can do stuff like, um, we'll make USA uh, blue dot dash. So blue is the color and we want a dot dash. We want dot markers and a dash, a straight line. That's basically what we're saying. Cool, so now we have every third year, but we have points for every time we actually have a data point. So that looks good. We can do the same thing for the other ones. Uh, red dot dash. And what's cool too is you see that the legend changes as we do that. South Korea, let's say uh, green dot dash. Cool, I like the look of this. Still, we need to do some more modifications. Let's add labels to our X and Y axis. So X label will be year. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, then the Y label will be um, US dollars. Cool, so now you can see, you know, okay, in year 2008, South Korea paid approximately $6 per gallon of gas. We're all translating all these values to US dollars, while Canada paid about $4, and the US paid about $3. So that looks pretty good to me, and we can easily add some more 
countries here. So I could like add Australia, for example, and we'll make them, uh, I don't know what color to use. I don't know the any more uh, yellow, sure. It might be an ugly color. Eh, it's not too bad. But yeah, there we have Australia. It looks like they're missing maybe a data value for 1990, I'm not positive. But yeah, we can easily do this for all of our different graphs. And we could even do something like, let's comment this out temporarily. We could do something like for country in uh, the, the, the gas. Let's see what happens at that print country. Yeah, cool. This is giving us all of the different countries. We don't want year. So I'm going to say in gas one onwards. Now we have, oh no. Close, close, close. Okay. I'm going to be a little bit hacky here. If country is not equal to year, print country. Now we get all of the countries. And so what we could do with this now is, you know, there's probably a little bit neater of a way to do this than if country is not equal to year. Uh, but I'm just trying to show you how like we could do this very quick and uh, efficiently. Do gas.year and then country, uh, and we'll let it self-select the colors. Uh, but we could, if we wanted to specify marker equals dot and I think the line style will be fine already. Oh no. Unrecognized character in, oh, okay. We can't just do country, we need to do gas country. Look at that. Now we got all of the different, uh, all of the different countries in our graph. And you could move, there's ways within matplotlib to like move the legend outside of the graph. I'm not gonna go into that right now, but another, I guess, comment that I have is whenever you're doing anything with matplotlib or anything with Python in general is like, quickly do a Google search, like how to move legend outside of matplotlib graph. And you'll find probably on Stack Overflow within the first three searches, someone that had the same problem as you and found an answer to it. So I always recommend doing that. Uh, but this is kind of cool that we were able to quickly graph all of these different lines for all the different countries. And if you wanted to, you could like create a list like countries um, to look at, maybe not the best name, and you could choose exactly which ones you wanted to include. And then you would do if not equals year and, or actually you could just do if country in countries to look at. Maybe I'll do this real quick. If country in countries to look at. So you see, this is another way we can graph specific things. Cool, cool, cool. All right, I'm gonna comment this out temporarily and just leave. I'll leave it, I'll, I'll push it to the GitHub when we're done with this video. And we'll uncomment this again. Cool. And yeah, you can play around with this style. You can use the shorthand notation or you can use the longhand notation that we kind of used here. But you also can reference the first video I posted on matplotlib to really play around with your line graph styles. All right, we're pretty much done with this graph, but I'll add a couple final things before I move on to the FIFA data and doing some other graphs. So the first thing is um, changing up the font size. I mentioned this in the previous matplotlib video I did, but uh, I thought it was worth mentioning again. So we can add a font dict to our title. And actually we can add this to any text-based label. So you could also add it to the X label and Y label. Uh, and we can do all sorts of different tweaks to our font. Um, I put a list in the description to all the different fonts you can use here if you wanted to change up the actual font type. Um, but I'm gonna keep the font type the same. 
I'm going to change the font weight. I'm going to make it bold. So you see it now. It's not bold. But if I do this, watch what happens. Now it's bold. And let's say I also wanted to change the font size. I would say font size. And let's say it's size 22. So now we have a larger font. Maybe 18 is a better value. Um, so you can do that. You can do that for any of your, your labels. Uh, another thing we might want to do is in the, when I showed this graph originally, I also added the year 2011. We don't have values for 2011, but maybe you wanted to allow for the ability of that showing up and maybe project where they're going. You could do plus, you take your ticks and plus 2011. Ah, that did not work. Um, so this is a lit or this is a data frame, so we can't just directly add 2011. So we need to make it a list. Still didn't work. And the problem is the data frame is kind of weird when you add just a direct list. So you can do dot to list and now do this. And now you see 2011 is there. Um, and then if you wanted to actually save this graph, remember we can do plot dot save fig. We can give it a name. So gas price figure, sure. And remember when we're saving, uh, if you change the DPI, you'll get a higher resolution image. So 300 is a good value. This is gonna make a pretty big image. It's gonna make a 300 times eight, which is 2400 by 1500 image. But so really you can play around with this video, but the higher the resolution or the higher DPI, the higher resolution image you're gonna get. So, oh, I don't wanna say this as a PNG. So if I went into that folder that I had, as you can see, uh, where did it go? Refresh. Oh, I don't know where I'm saving this. Gas price figure, where are you? All right, sorry, I typed this in wrong. Save fig. Uh, and you always just, you can refresh and look at the documentation. I might have gotten, yeah, I got an error here. I should have noticed that before, but yeah, save fig, one word, do that. Now, if I go to the folder that I have these files in, we've got gas price figure. And if I bring that in, you see the figure there saved nicely as a PNG. All right, let's move on to the FIFA data. Now that we're done with the gas price stuff, let's move on to using our FIFA data. So we're first gonna have to load it in so, and if you didn't save it, the FIFA data, uh, maybe if you skipped around this video, um, it's on my GitHub page and the link to that is in the description and you wanna save it in the same directory of the file that you're using to uh, produce these graphs. Uh, lo <laughs> I'm mixing my words, load FIFA data. Um, okay, so to do that, we'll just call FIFA equals pd.readcsv. And I believe we called this FIFA data.csv. And let's just check to make sure it's loaded in properly. Cool. And this is actually, shoot, I shouldn't have loaded it all. Uh, okay, it's still a preview, but you could do something. If you only wanted to see like the first five rows, you can do FIFA.head five. All right, so, so you can get a feel for what's in this data. Um, you got like the name of the player, and you should probably recognize some of these guys' names Lionel Messi. Ronaldo, Neymar, all very good players. I think it's right now sorted probably by their overall. But yeah, it's all the stats from the game FIFA for these guys. And I think it just provides a good set of data uh, to work from. And also I took this data from a Kaggle challenge. I'm gonna link to the original source of the data as well um, down in the description. Okay, so what can we do with this? So to start off, Let's do some histogram stuff. Okay, so what I think is a cool first thing to do is plot the overall skill level here that you see on the right. Just figure out in the game, like how many people have above a 90, how many people have between an 80 and 90. Um, Etc. So what we can do to do that is we have our data already loaded. I don't have to reload it in, but I can go ahead and do. Um, let's see, plot, 
And the way that I remember these commands is like, I showed in the last video, you can kind of use the PyPlot um, documentation as your kind of your starting point. And then if you're looking to try to do a histogram, look up histogram within that documentation. The link to the documentation is in the description and you'll find the command hist. So what I can pass into hist is within the FIFA data set, I'm gonna pass in the overall skill level as my input. And let's see what happens when I do that. And then I'll do a plot.show so I don't get all this random stuff. Okay, that looks pretty good. It's already starting to get there. Um, what would probably be more helpful is if this kind of, these tick marks were centered for each bin that we have. And I'll do that in a sec. All right, we're gonna set the bins every 10 overall skill level points. So like the highest you could be in the FIFA game is 100, the lowest you could be is a zero. So we'll do our bins at intervals of 10 up to from zero to 100. So the first bin that we have will be all players that have a skill level between zero and 10, and it's counting uh, that number. 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and then finally 100. Cool. So, oh, <laughs> I didn't do anything yet. Now we can set the bins parameter of the, the histogram to our bins. Now we got a nice, a uh, little bit nicer of a graph. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is set our X ticks to be the bins as well. So now it's nicely labeled. Each interval corresponds exactly with what we have here. Um, but it looks like we have some unnecessary data. So it looks like there's very little players over here. So maybe I'll limit this, start at 40 and go up to 100. And what's kind of crazy is, you know, the players that are over a 90 are really a, uh, a rarity because you can't even see that bar from the 90 to 100 range there. So let's do a little bit, um, get out a title, same way as before, get out a Y label. So I'll do a Y, y label real quick, uh, number of players. And the X label would be the skill level. And then we could add a title that would be like uh, distribution of player skills in, in FIFA. I think it's FIFA 2018, it might be 2019, not positive. Um, so that's a cool little visualization and you can get more into details, like to actually see that there are some values there. You could do, you could change up your Y ticks to be, let's say zero to 100. Uh, okay, that didn't work. I guess it's kind of tough with all of these players, but if we did move it from like 80 to 100, you see that, yeah, there are actually players that are above a 90. It's just very, very few compared to the amount of players in the game. Another thing you could potentially do is maybe break it up, use the data, and uh, only look at the stats of players on certain teams, and then you would get all of the noise, I guess, in the, the lower skill levels that like put all the people in here. Uh, one little modification we could make to this is let's say we wanted to change the color of our bar. Um, I could set this, you know, I could set it to red easily like that, or I could set it to a hexadecimal value um, very easily. And what I recommend whenever you want a certain color, what you can do is just like do a Google search for a color picker. And as you see here, um, I can just move this bar around and no matter what color I want, so let's say I want this greenish color, I copy that hex code, 
hide this, paste in the hex code. Now I get that green color. Uh, I kind of like the bluish color, so I'm gonna go with that. But yeah, you can play around and get any color you want with Matplotlib. All right, let's do pie charts next. And just to start off, uh, I kind of mentioned this, the histograms, but to like figure out how to do a pie chart, I usually just start at this documentation, look up pie, plot a pie chart is right there. And then with this page, I can kind of get all the details of what I can pass in and what are the parameters that I can play around with. Um, yeah, a lot of good stuff here. Okay, so the wedge sizes is our X and that's what we're gonna input here. So what does that look like? Okay, so I'm gonna just output some of our data again. And what I think we're gonna do for this first chart is one of the components of this, I guess we can't see it here, but if you opened up the full, um, yeah, I can't see all of it. If you opened up the full file within like uh, Excel, you would see that one of the parameters we can have is preferred foot. So if I look up that, you see that left or right, it's whether you play left or righty in soccer. So what I think would be interesting to do a pie chart on is uh, the percentage of people that play with their left foot versus their right foot. So how would we do something like that? Well, we can count the number of people that play with their left foot by doing the following. And this plays into the stuff that I taught in the, that we went through in the uh, pandas video. But we can use the dot loc to kind of like look up the data set or kind of filter the data set by a specific condition. In this case for left, we want a, the condition to be, um, apologize one sec. We want the condition to be if the preferred foot column is equal to left, then we want only the data that this condition holds. And because we're gonna to need to pass this into a pie chart, what we'll wanna do is get the count of that. And I believe this count gives us an array. I can probably check. So let's see, what is left? Yeah, it's like an array here. So if we do count zero, we'll actually get a number, as you can see. 4,211 players prefer their left foot. Um, and so we can do the same thing with right. It's FIFA.loc, FIFA preferred foot equals equals right. Get the count of that. And then because this returns a data frame, we have to take the, we'll just take the first element, which it will be a number. And let's see how much like right okay so considerably more people preference their right foot than their left that makes sense um okay so now how do we do the pie chart well we can do plot.py this is from the documentation and i guess i kind of jumped ahead but you might like think maybe i can just go ahead and do fifa preferred i can't even spell of course that won't work foot and like figure that i might just plot the pie chart while doing that but it it gets messed up when you don't pass it numbers. So what we need to do is pass in a list of numbers. So what we can do is left comma right. So now we have um, two values and I'll make a part pie chart out of these values. Look at that, cool. And I'll do plot dot show. One thing I'm noticing is these colors are really ugly and also nothing is labeled right now. So going back to the documentation, uh, you can see labels is a list, sequence of strings providing the labels for each wedge. We can pass in that. We can also change up the colors with a list as well. So let's do that. So labels will do equals left and right and we'll pass those into our pie chart. Do labels equals labels. 
Cool. So now at least we have like relative percentages. I mean, we don't know the exact percentages, but you have an idea just based off the graph. Um, if we added in colors, we could change this ugly orange from being there. So you could pass in two colors. Uh, let's say like, we're gonna just use some hexadecimal values. I'm just typing in these in randomly. Uh, and now I have to pass in colors here. Cool. Um, well, that looks all right. Maybe you'd want a little bit more contrast, but it doesn't really matter too, too much. You can be the judge of that. If I do auto percentage, this should, um, I forget exactly how to format this. I'll have to check. So auto percentage, um, Format percent uh, will be format. So we can use a percent notation here. So we can do percent dot point two f, and basically it'll just fill in whatever value is for the percentage with uh, point two two decimals of uh, floats. And I guess I screwed that up. It probably has to be a string. Cool. So now it actually gives us our percentages. So 23.19% of the people in the FIFA game prefer their left foot over their right foot. And if you wanna actually see percent on that, it's a little bit weird, you can just do percent percent. Basically, if you just did percent, I think it would bug out because it's expecting specific notation. Basically by doing two percentage points in this notation, it knows you actually do want that percentage sign. All right, and then we could add a label, the title, as we've done in the past. Preference, foot preference of FIFA players. Cool, and there's a basic pie chart. I'm trying to think if there's other things I should add to this. Um, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more complicated stuff in the next uh, pie chart that we'll build. So this is a pretty simple pie chart. Let's make another pie chart. All right, pie chart number two. So in this one, uh, what we're gonna do is look at the breakdown of the weights of the FIFA players and we'll plot it as a pie chart. So, I mean, okay, let's look at what the weights look like. So I'm gonna print out weight here. Okay, so we have a list of all these weights. What we can see is that they're, and note that they're in pounds. Uh, they're not in kilograms as many of you guys might expect. They're in pounds, but you could, initial step you could do to this pie chart would be to convert all these values to kilograms. That'd be a fun little exercise. Um, but okay, we have all these pounds. And one thing I immediately notice is if we're trying to count ranges of these pounds, it's gonna be tough with this pounds string attached. Is there anything else I notice here? No, it's mostly just that, but okay. So basically what I wanna do is reset the weight category to not include these pounds and just be the number. So this is going to be a string right now and we just want this converted to an integer. So let's try to do that. Okay, so we're gonna reset the weight column and what we're gonna to wanna to do is strip off, so X here, we're gonna do X for X in FIFA.weight. So X in this case is going to be a string, so we can do strip uh, LBS. So that will give us just this part of the string for X in FIFA.weight. Let's see if that works. Ah, float object has no attribute strip, interesting. I'm ex I was expecting that all these would be strings um, start to start with, but because they're not, what we can add is an if statement within our list comprehension. And we're gonna just say if type x equals equals string. I'm guessing maybe there's a couple empty values or something. So we're just gonna kind of ignore those. Um, and then else x. So if type x equals equals string, we're gonna do this. 
else just leave it as is. That's what we're saying here. Let's see if this works. Now we print out FIFA.wait. Cool, cool. And uh, I'm gonna take the first value real quick. And notice it's still a string. So what we're actually gonna to wanna to do to this line is surround it with the int block, which will convert it to an int. Now, if I look at this, fifa.wait zero, we get it um, as a integer value. I don't know why it's giving a decimal here, but it should be an actual value. Uh, and you notice because of the point zero, we know that it probably is being read as a value. Okay, so now we have these values set right. So let's start counting things. So we're gonna start with light players and we'll say light players have a weight under, this is kind of arbitrary, but we're gonna say that they have a weight under 125 pounds. And then we're gonna count that just like we did in the last example. Uh, and then the next condition we'll do is, I guess, uh, medium light players. That will be above 125, greater than or equal to 125. Then we need an and condition. The and condition, and the way we're gonna format this with our pandas notation is like that. And this is probably review a bit if you did watch, watch through the uh, pandas video that I did. And FIFA.weight is less than 150, let's say. So now we're getting only the rows that have both of these conditions true. We're gonna count that zero. Um, keep doing this. I'll probably speed this up when I uh, edit the video. I'm gonna just get three more categories. All right, cool. So we have five different weight categories and I can like print these out. Oh no, invalid syntax, what did I do? Oh, didn't end that. 369 heavy people, medium heavy. Let's see if this is a valid number, 4,000. So yeah, it makes sense that there's more between 170 and 200 than there are people over 200 in the league. It's kind of tough to be a soccer player over 200 pounds. Okay, so let's now plot this. So what we want to plot will be our weights. And I'll make this an array. Light, light, medium, 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 heavy, and heavy. And our labels. Ah. Can't type today. All right, so plot dot pi weights. Let's see what this looks like. Cool, it looks pretty good, um, but it has no labels right now. And I'm gonna do a plot dot show. So we need to add some labels. So under 125 is the first one. Um, 125 to 150 is the second. 150 to 175 is the third, and 175 to 200 is the fourth, and finally over 200 is the last. And we'll pass these in with our pipe chart. Okay, cool. So now we have all these labels. Uh, one thing I don't like, and this is a good little thing to know is you can, I don't like the default color scheme and instead of passing in all five of my own colors, one thing you can actually do is, I don't know what I just typed in. I didn't mean to do that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Is there's a plot.style. And so instead of the default, which is currently set, as you can see, it stays the same when I do that. We're gonna use the style of ggplot and I'll uh, link a list of these different styles in the description. So I personally like this color scheme a lot more when I change the style of our plot. Okay, so that's pretty good. 
We can also add the auto percentage as we did with the last example. So percentage point two F, percentage percentage percentage. Cool. But things are a little bit ugly in this case. The things are squished together. So how can we resolve this problem? And really, if you go into the documentation, you'll see there's a lot of these weird names and you might not know what everyone means, but if you kind of look up, like if you did a Google search, like uh, pie chart, uh, Python, numbers getting in the way of each other, you'd probably find some different solutions. So one solution we could go ahead and try would be setting the percentage distance. So the percentage distance is the percentage distance from the center of the graph. So if I did percentage equals percentage distance equals zero, you'd see everything's right there. So instead of that, we'll do like 0 0.8. So this comes zero to one is within the chart. And you could even do, if you wanted to, like 1.5, and that would be values outside the chart. But 0 0.8 was a good value that I thought. Okay, so this maybe makes it a little bit better. These numbers right here that I'm highlighting aren't as squished, but they're still not great. So the other thing we can actually do is use this explode property. And what explode does, it breaks the graph apart a bit. And so let's see what that does. So we need a, a list that's as big as our, um, yeah, this could be a list, it can be a tuple. I'm gonna set it as a tuple. That's what I did when I was playing around with this. It doesn't, shouldn't matter. Zero, 0 0.4. I'm gonna, these are the values I wanna to get to, but we'll start with doing them all 0.1 and I'll reason to why I got to the values that I got to. Okay, so explode equals explode. So this is gonna split the graph apart so it's not actually touching. So you see that. So that's cool. But really, we don't need everything exploded. We really just need these values that are very close together to explode a bit. So what we can do to that is, all right, so we want under 125 and over 200 to be exploded a bit more. As you can see, those correspond to our labels here. We don't really need 150 to 175 to explode at all, because that's pretty set. We don't really need um, 175 to 200 to explode. So what does this look like now? And we'll have this explode a little bit. This is this 12.61%. Cool. And I think that this looks decently good now. You can more easily see the different slivers. And I guess it's tough because this sliver is so small, the under, one, under 125, but I think that you can more easily read this than you could when all of them were compact together. And as in the other examples, we could also add a title. So weight distribution of FIFA players. And we would want to say that this is in pounds. Cool. And also, as you notice, because I changed the style, the header actually changed too. So that's one thing to be a little bit careful with, with the styles, but sometimes they can be very helpful. All right, uh, because this video is getting kind of long, we're gonna end it with one more graph. Uh, but if there's other types of graphs that I didn't cover in this video or my previous video that you wanna see, let me know in the comments. So we're gonna do a box and whiskers chart. And really the question we're trying to ask here is, uh, how can we compare teams, like the how good two different teams are in our set? So looking back at our FIFA chart, just let's print that out. Um, so you can see that uh, all of these players have a club. So we're trying to compare the relative strengths of different clubs. And so the, I thought that a good way to do that would be this to use this box and whiskers chart, which shows um, shows your highest player or it shows your highest score. If you have a box and whiskers chart, it will show like the max. It will show the mean. And then it'll show a box around where the middle 50% of scores or values were. And I think that's a good way to compare a team where you, you can kind of see, okay, where's the best player at? Where's their worst player at if everyone got injured? And then the, the middle box is kind of like the core of the team, like how good are they? Um, so I think it's a good way to potentially 
compared to a different teams. Maybe you can disagree with me. Maybe there's a different way you would recommend, but that's what we're going to do in this example. So to start, let's uh, take a couple teams and count their um, their overall scores for that club. So we'll start with, uh, what's a good team to start with? Go up top. We'll start with FC Barcelona. So we're going to do Barcelona equals FIFA.log. So we're going to filter out all of the rows that have people from Barcelona. So we can do FIFA.club equals equals FC Barcelona. Yeah. Cool. And let's see. And then we want, when we do our averaging, we're going to want to take their overall score so we can just filter by that too so now if we print out barcelona because we're comparing the overall scores i think that's the most useful metric you see we just have a list of all the players on barcelona their um, relative their overall performance in fifa cool and we could do that with another team let's say we do uh real madrid FIFA.club equals equals Real Madrid. And we want to take their overall values as well. Cool. So this is two different values. We can see Madrid here and all those values. Okay, so now let's plot a box and whiskers chart for that. So to do that, we do plot.boxplot. We pass in Barcelona and we'll pass in Madrid. So these are the all the values for Barcelona and all the values for Madrid and corresponds to what we see here. So it, it will know, this function will know that it needs to make a box plot off of that. So what does that look like? Okay, one thing I noticed too, um, this is also a, a residual effect of changing the style in one cell. Style is still changed. I'm gonna change the style here back to our default style. So default style looks like this. Graph doesn't really tell us too much right now, but we'll get it to look a little better in a second. Um, and I wanna do plot.show so all this stuff is not there. Okay, cool. So this is a comparison of the two teams relatively. You can see they're pretty dang even. Uh, I'd say Barcelona has a slight advantage um, it seems like its box is a little bit higher than Real Madrid's, but and also their best player is ranked better than Real Madrid's best player. But it's kind of annoying when it just says one and two down here. So let's add our labels. So it's a list: FC Barcelona and Real Madrid. And then we can go into our box plot. It has a labels property, and you can double check the documentation to see this. Labels, labels, cool. So now we have our two different box plots. And so these two teams with this comparison, I would just say that they look pretty similarly matched. Like they could go head to head, probably be a pretty good game. Where you really see kind of the coolness of visualizing this data uh, with a box and plot and like comparing two teams is when you take a team that's not as strong. So my local team here in Boston is the New England Revolution. They're an MLS uh, soccer organization. So I also pass in some scores for them. And their shortened name is the Revs. So I'm gonna just call them that instead of typing out the whole New England Revolu uh, Revolu uh, Revolution every time. And uh, yeah, uh, what am I trying to say? New England Revolution. And we wanna take their overall. And you could look at all the different teams in the data sheet and get like a certain team that you wanted to look at, pretty easy. Uh, you just have to be careful that you type in everything properly. And apparently I did something wrong. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, we also wanna pass in the revs here. Cool. 
So now we have three teams, and you can see that the New England Revolution is significantly worse than Real Madrid or Barcelona, which is what we were wanting to show. Um, let's add a title here, and we'll add some style to this chart as well. Um, professional soccer team comparison. And because I'm from the States, I call it soccer. Yeah, you probably call it football. But that is besides the point. FIFA overall rating. Eh, overall rating is our Y axis. And we have our teams down here in the X axis. That looks pretty good to me. <sighs> okay, what we could also change up potentially would be um, our tick marks. Uh, okay, or we could change the figure size. Maybe it would look better if it stretched out a bit more along the Y axis. So we'll change our figure size a bit. So plot dot figure, fig size equals, we'll have the Y dimension be greater than the X. And as you can see, now it looks like this. And this gives us a little bit more detail in the actual scores among the two teams. But yeah, you can still see the New England Revolution is not as good. And also this name is kind of running into each other. So I'm gonna shorten New England Revolution to any revolution to just kind of make it a little neater. Cool. All right, so the final thing we're gonna do is add a little bit of style to this graph so it looks a little bit better. And you also, if you wanted to, yeah, feel free to add more teams to this and like really see the differences between soccer teams and FIFA. But we will uh, add some color around the perimeters of these boxes, maybe make this line a little thicker. That represents, this represents the medium, the orange line. Uh, okay, so what I found to be the best way to do this is I'm gonna save boxes as the result of this plot. And then basically what we can do is this will store the three different values we plotted here. So it'll help us style each individual box a little easier. So for box in boxes, uh, boxes. So you're getting the box parameter from what was saved here. Uh, we wanna set the color and there, this also kind of shows you that there's different ways to do these things. Like I could have passed color in here. The problem with passing color within here is it would make everything the same color. So if you wanted to like go ahead and change a specific box, uh, like and have a list of colors, um, it's easier, or I guess maybe colors is not the best example because colors probably would allow you to pass an array. Um, but for certain properties, it's hard to set just one value at a time. So I'm gonna go ahead and set the color here. So now you see that we have a different color around our box. And they're similar to boxes here, there's another parameter uh, for like the long strike here and the long strike here, the whiskers of the box and whiskers plot. Uh, but I think it could use to be a little thicker here. And so to do that, we're going to do line width equals two. And all these parameters I'm finding from the uh, from the documentation. Okay, cool. So set edge color basically. And let's say we wanted to change the fill color. So change fill color. And you could, as I said before, like you could iterate through these and through a list and like each time set a different color for each of these. So change fill color, we could do something like set uh, face color. We could all do this in one line as well, but kind of just showing different ways you can go about things. Uh, face color is another property. This actually changes the inside of the box. So what happens when I do E0, E0, E0? This is a grayish color. Ah, unknown property face color. And this was something that I found super annoying when I was trying to do this. Um, 
So if you're trying to set the face color of a box and whisker chart, doesn't recognize, it can't like recognize this property face color for whatever reason by default. So you actually have to set this patch artist property to true to allow you to change the face color. So now we have these graphs. I think that looks a bit better. Uh, we could also change up the median line. So you could do it within this format or another way we can do it is uh, one of the properties of box plot is median props. So you could also pass in like a dictionary of median props. And so we could pass in a line width here too. So let's say we wanted this line to have the same thickness as um, the outline. Pass that in and there we go. A lot of the styling stuff, it's really a matter of uh, Google searching, really. Like you can look at the documentation, find some things from the documentation, but what I find is sometimes quicker is to say, oh, how do I change the outline color in a box and whiskers chart? Uh, Google search that, find a stack overflow post, and then like from there figure out I can do this type of technique. Uh, that's what works usually well for me. All right, so yeah, now we have these three teams being compared. I'm gonna shrink the graph a little bit so you can see better. And I think this is a kind of a cool way to visualize how teams compare in FIFA. All right, I'm gonna end the video here. Uh, hopefully these graphs were helpful. Hopefully it's helpful to combine the pandas and like the CSVs with the matplotlib library. If you found this video useful, make sure to throw it a big thumbs up. And also don't forget to subscribe because I'll be posting uh, a lot of videos in the near future.